good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. I am delighted to um, host today one of my favorite um, writers, but also um, a good friend. And I feel like a little girl meeting her Shiro, you know, on screen. Um, so welcome to our webinar series. As you know, we started the webinar series about a year ago um, during the pandemic. And we've hosted several uh, very high level discussions. And today um, you'll be hearing from Dr. Pippa Grange. And um, she's a highly sought after influential sports psychologist and a culture coach working across elite sports and business internationally. As head of people and team development at the FA, she worked closely with the England team for the World Cup in 2018. As we will hear, Pippa believes that relationships are at the heart of everything and the antidote to fear. Pippa is now part of the senior leadership for the Global Right to Dream group, working on cultural strategy. She's particularly invested in ensuring opportunities for women and girls. She's also passionate about finding a different archetype for women working in sport and other male dominated areas. Pippa's latest book, Fearless, um, How to Win at Life Without Losing Yourself, has just been published in paperback as well. Welcome, Pippa, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Ebru, thank you for having me. Um, I, I'm not sure that I should be the one who's the hero here. I've been um, watching you and watching your work over my career, and uh, you know, I, I could say the same. So it's lovely to be with you here, and I, I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So um, without further ado, let's just jump into a very exciting conversation. Um, you've had quite a career so far. Um, tell us what was the catalyst for you writing this book? Yeah, um, I think over there's a couple of things. Um, you know, as a, a sports psychologist, I have I'm very clear that um, you know, statistically, 80% of performance is, a, is about our mental agility, our ability to cope and our ability to use our mental skills well. But I feel still that we don't understand how it works. Um, some aspects of sport particularly aren't, still aren't very good at understanding how to achieve that mental freedom. So there was that aspect that, you know, how can I contribute to evolving that conversation so we get better at that? But there was probably an even bigger bit, and that is that over the course of a you know 25 years in the field, working with some really incredible performers, really successful people, I noticed a very common, uh, uh, alarmingly common pattern, and that was that um, many winners didn't actually stop long enough to enjoy their wins. They, um, they were achieving all sorts of things and climbing all sorts of ladders, but they weren't really feeling their success. In fact, mostly they were feeling that straight after the win, they had to get back on the horse, so to speak, and immediately go and um, get ready for the next challenge. And for me, that was a real loss um, in terms of the soul of sport and what we're here to do. Um, and I felt that, you know, people were actually very lost under this burden of the fear of not being good enough. Um, and I wanted to see if I could try and start a conversation or contribute to a conversation about how we can face that and do something differently. Yeah, I, I loved reading the book. Um, why, why did you make fear the central team? Tell us a little bit more about fear. Yeah. Um, Fear is, you know, something I, I describe as sort of a constant companion in life. And unlike other types of emotions, for example, shame, uh, which isn't natural and it's manufactured, fear is an entirely natural phenomena. Um, and it will, the reason the book is called Fearless rather than Fearless is that, you know, we will always have it. Um, the, the job is to kind of, um, make sure it's at the right size, the right volume, and it's not distracting, disrupting, or uh, getting in our way of achieving our potential. So, you know, fear became the central theme uh, because I think it is so pervasive, but also because I very often see fear represented in different ways. 
So when we look at somebody and, and you know, how often do you hear, oh, that person has a really huge ego. And when, as soon as I hear that, I think mm, there's probably some insecurity that's fear-based at the back of that. Yeah. So the, the root of fear um, shows up in many different ways. And I think we quite often um, mistake other things that are actually fear. Um, and so, you know, if we, can, if we can dig that out and work on the real stuff, it's uh, got a lot of power to change the way we experience life and particularly the way we experience performance. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very true. And um, it comes out very vividly and clearly uh, through all the personal um, stories in the in the book and um, you know from the parental pressures to um, societal pressures everybody has a lot going on in their lives and um, you've portrayed this this notion of fear underlying fear quite well through all these examples so it is the constant companion in our lives as you just explained and how did you discover all this in the different um, stories like can you just walk us a little bit through some of the different types of fear that came out from your work yeah um it sort of it, you know it became apparent that fear uh, i describe fear as an energy it's like an emotional energy but there's two different well, there's more, but the, the two central ones, the two central types of fear are what I describe as in the moment fear, which is the fear that you might feel if you're standing on the penalty spot or if you drive into a bend too quickly uh, in your car or if you see if you're out running and there's a rustle in the bushes and you think, is that a snake or a, you know, something dangerous? And a, a fear when um, there is a stimulus that creates threat for you right in the moment fear uh, so there's the kind of energy that goes with that um, and really that's the stuff that we deal with um, performance wise that's the first stuff that we deal with from a technique perspective you know that is stuff that we can absolutely address and minimize and learn how to respond to in the moment but it's not enough because there is this other kind of fear this this sort of secondary but really really deep kind of fear which I call not good enough fear and even if you're brilliant at handling it in the moment you may still be kind of robbed of the full experience of life and the full experience of your performance including joy if you don't get a hold of the not good enough fear and this has really deep roots um as I said fear is very natural but um as human beings are our deepest fears that we have two really deep fears. One is death, obviously, and the other one is um, abandonment. And in our modern busy lives, abandonment shows up as rejection. Will I get rejected? Am I going to be able to belong? We have such a massive need to belong as a human species that, you know, when there is a threat to belonging or a threat to being acceptable and loved, and um, you know, brought into the tribe rather than excluded and exposed and left out on your own, which you know looks like loneliness and looks like um, all, all sorts of forms of rejection. When that's a threat, that is a whole other layer. And I think the not good enough fear drives us very deeply. So it's not enough just to deal with the techniques of how you manage your mind, get back in your body and handle fear in the moment you have to also address those deep roots of of not not feeling good enough as a human being and and their sort of association with being rejected yeah um we do uh within our leadership courses um several you know modules i especially teach on confidence and confidence building mm -hmm. and i often get questions like can confidence be learned and in an indirect way, I believe, yes, it can be learned because as you very well explained, there are many different forces, you know, running underneath. And um, in our really interactive sessions um, with the participants, I always ask, what's the worst that can happen? Like, you know, they're telling yeah. me that they don't like, you know, they, have, they know the answer, they have a great idea, but they can't bring it up during the meetings. And 
when you again dig deeper into it, it's that fear of being excluded, as you say, or being ridiculed for an idea that may not have been perfect, but mm -hmm. um, also the whole, you know, fear of not being good enough. You know, am I good enough to speak in front of, you know, 10 other men when I'm the only woman in the room? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, it's, almost it's not of course simple to solve these issues but creating that awareness and challenging them with the question why not you know yeah. and what if you were yeah. to speak up and said something wrong you know what would happen mm -hmm. it's not that people are gonna you know leave you behind just because you said something wrong for for the first time you know but mm -hmm. if you stay quiet you're never going to be part of that inner circle right it, it, you know, this, uh, I'm so pleased you've brought this up because, you know, I, I wholeheartedly believe that confidence can be learned, you know, but there's this kind of um, two mountains to climb with confidence. There's, there's kind of the uh, behaved confidence, you know, what are the things that I have to do, like speak up, like step forward, like, um, you know, put myself in the position where I can be seen where I will take that action, where I will put my hand up, whatever it happens to be. Um, there's, there's a behaved confidence. And then there's a plus sign to the next mountain and that's the felt confidence, right? So what is going on in my internal self that um, is you know, the way that confidence feels? So you know, when we start thinking about things like humor and being able to laugh at yourself or take things more lightly when we think about things like pride and being um, able to celebrate what you have done well when we think about an attitude to failure or a perspective or anything that builds esteem where um, a person is feeling like it's okay to have a go and fail so what most things we do in life fail that's just maths that's just, you know, anybody who, who has ever succeeded at something has failed many more times before they got there. So, you know, it's the felt confidence that goes along with the behaved confidence. We have to work on both of those. Um, but both have huge elements of fear. The behaved confidence is where in the moment fear comes in. Like, you know, can I, um, can I actually take this step? What will I, how can I break this action down so that I can take one step after the next, et cetera. And then the felt confidence is a perspective. What is my, what do I see this? How do I link this to a sense of my purpose, to my growth, to my, um, you know, who I want to be seen as, as a, um, a mother, a coach, a colleague, a sister, whatever that happens to be. Right. So they're the things that come together. And that's about not good enough fear. That's the, the felt confidence is where the not good enough fear comes in. And you have to get that stuff isn't solved quickly. Your behaved confidence can be solved quite quickly, actually, when you learn how, you know, with the, the techniques that are in the book. And, and I'm sure many of your listeners know a lot of this already. But the stuff that is the felt confidence is where the fear is kicking around, the deeper fear. And that's a shift in perspective that takes us. Um, you have to put, you have to be willing to go on a journey for that, but exactly. it's such a worthwhile journey. Yeah. It's a long journey, uh, but that whole personal transformation, uh, once you embark on it, um, it just opens up so many new alleys and uh, motivation created by even making the first, you know, step, gives you the, the, you know, will to continue. That's, that's what we are seeing in the attendees of our leadership courses. So um, back to the, to the book, and um, though we diverted a little bit, everything again ties, of course, to this. So related, um, yeah. They're all related to each other. And mm -hmm. um, how can we overcome this feeling of we are not good enough? Because we hear that so much from our you know, members in different discussions. And as you said, this is not necessarily inherent, but it's a, it's a bit of you know, learned um, feeling and response because it wasn't that we were born being not good enough. It's just the experiences have um, closed us up in a way. Uh, so 
how do we get out of this mind frame and loop? Yeah. Well, I think, as I said, the first thing is to recognize that it's, it is a journey. It doesn't happen overnight, but there are a number of things that you can do to start that. Um, and, and they're almost all about shifting perspective, right? So in the book, um, I talk about things like um, changing the story, changing the narrative, right? It's, sometimes we actually forget that when it comes to things like the fear of not being good enough, the pen's in our hand. We are writing that story um, a lot of the time and we keep kind of writing the same story that, you know, what if I fail? What if people see me? Um, you know, what if what if I'm revealed as not being quite as great, great as the next person or, you know, um, we, we repeat the story again and again. But actually, we have the both the authority and the agency to change that story ourselves. And when you start telling a different story about yourself, it is self-perpetuating. It's very, very powerful. If you start saying, instead of saying, I'm not, the, I'm, I'm not quite there yet as a coach. If you start saying, I am 60% better than where I was last year. And in a year, I'm going to be here. Um, you know, and if you start telling a story about possibility and abundance and success, and um, what is available to you rather than a story about scarcity and, and what's not there yet and what you're afraid of. It's an extremely powerful leap. It seems so simple, but to change the story and decide what story you want to tell about yourself, um, it's, it's huge. Um, I sometimes say to people, how would you tell this story about your best friend or about your, somebody you love dearly how would you get them to tell the story of themselves? Rather than when we do it ourselves, we tend to be very self-effacing, um, overly critical, even overly uh, modest, you know, because, uh, and there's fear at the bottom of that pile. There's, there's, there is fear of um, what if I stand out? What if somebody thinks I'm taking too much credit? All of those things lingering in the background, right? You've, First of all, see, see them for what they are. I talk about see, face, replace in the book. First, see what's going on, right? Plant your feet, have a good look at what you're actually afraid of. Most of us don't ask that question. We just carry on repeating the same story about ourselves and, and repeating the same fears. Plant your feet and ask, what am I really afraid of? As you said, every, what was the worst that could happen, right? And dig down and expose those fears have a look at them yourself. You don't have to share them with anybody, but have a look, right? And then when, you've, when you can unearth them, you face them. And what I mean by that is fear is uncomfortable. Everybody would agree, fear is horrible. You don't like it, doesn't feel good in your body. It's, it's consuming, it's, a, it's an awful energy. But if you can have the little bit of courage to stay a bit longer and look at how that fear is showing up in your life, right? What does it cost you? How does it impact your relationships? How does it impede the opportunities that you would take? Or, um, you know, how has it impeded the opportunities that you did take, right? Have a look at what it costs you um, and just stay a bit longer instead of, okay, this is how I fix it because we, we're such fixers. We want to immediately find a solution and not good enough fear isn't a quick fix. Can't do it quickly. So that's why I say, buckle up for the journey because it is a long haul and if we if we can actually first unearth it and then say okay what is the truth the real truth about how this is showing up in my life then you can start to replace it and you replace it with things like writing a different story for yourself finding a sense of purpose knowing how to surrender to what you control and what you don't control um, and allowing that a space in your life rather than feeling like you have to be perfect at all times and um, you can replace it with um I took, there's a, some great stories in the book that have been generous generously shared about um, the power of dreams and desires and how they can propel you beyond not good enough fear so there's a range of things that you can use to replace it that's actually the fun bit <laughs> the hard bit is 
genuinely seeing it and facing it because most of us are just let's move on I don't like this I've kind of yeah. fixed enough of it that I can get through next week kind of yeah. thing and and you know my encouragement comfort zone, right? <laughs> yeah my encouragement is to just okay I know you're brave I know at heart you're brave put your feet down and actually stay a little longer and look at the truth of what this costs you what it is and what it costs you then you know what to fix yeah I mean, in this confidence discussion, um, I asked the question, who or what crushed your confidence? You know, a range of options from childhood experiences to, you know, spouses, friends, teachers, you know, colleagues, bosses, media, whatever. But more often than not, it's the childhood experiences that are um, coming out as the biggest confidence crushes and thus creators of fear. So, how do you see this whole childhood experiences impact on, on fear? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that people say that, right? Um, human beings are one of the most vulnerable mammals for the longest time. When we are born, unlike other mammals that might be able to stand or feed themselves relatively quickly, we are completely dependent for quite a long period of time. If somebody doesn't pick, pick us up and nurses or feeders, we, we're done for, we can't survive, right? So we're utterly dependent on not being abandoned very early and vulnerable for a long time. So that sets us up um, for being responsive to fear. Um, our, our fear receptors are fully formed before we're even born. They're for, fully formed in the womb. We're born ready for fear. We're born ready to feel fear. And yet it takes like another 18 months or even two years for us to get some of the skills to rationalize the threat or the fear, like language or being able to ask for help or to understand that A equals B. We don't have that when we're born, but we have fully functioning fear. So of course we're set up in childhood to really, really deeply feel threat and particularly threat of rejection or abandonment. So childhood is very, very important. And it's terrifying for parents to think, oh, how do I not get this wrong? But, you know, kids are very resilient too, and that, but they respond to the messages around them all the time. So we have to keep feeding those messages of being um, okay and being resilient and being able to express need. They're really important. But then think about the fact that um, an adult, a uh, female brain won't finish developing till uh, we're about 23 or 24 and it's an, a year or two later for men. So for that whole long period of your life, you know, more than a quarter of your life, if you're lucky, um, you are in that zone without fully matured brain breaks, <laughs> without fully matured ability to understand and rationalize things that feel threatening, emotionally threatening. It takes really a long time, which is why adolescence are so the period of adolescence is so important. Um, childhood and adolescence of how we help people express themselves and feel safe um, and build resilience. So, you know, it's, it's a long old journey to get to that place where you can rationalize fear um, yeah. when we're adults. So we've got a lot of work to do in between to minimize those those um, stimulants of fear. But I think as well, every, there's a second piece to this, you know, we talk about childhood um, and, and how we develop to be fearful. Um, there's the part that's in us, the neurology and the neurobiology, as I just talked about, but then there's a part that's outside of us that's cultural and it's a reality, right? Many people still see fear as a good motivator at some level. Yeah. I, I don't agree. Fear is a good motivator if you need to do something urgently um, in an emergency, right? And our, our, we are wired for that to happen naturally. Um, fear can be a good motivator for 10 minutes if you need a lift, but it is not a way to live. It is not a motivator for life because it costs too much. It costs too much physically in, in terms of our health, our biochemistry. It definitely costs too much emotionally and mentally in terms of what it steals from us um, and you know the the kind of restriction it creates in our mental freedom um, and you know the rent's too high for fear to be a, a, mo a good motivator 
um, when I talk to coaches, I describe it as a lazy motivator. And oftentimes people just haven't really explored what else they can use as a, a, a better motivator, you know, and, um, and fear is the last weapon in your kit that you should deploy. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, maybe in, on our generation, whether we were elite athletes or, you know, obedient children of, of parents or, you know, of, of teachers in the classrooms, but I sincerely doubt it's going to work at all in, in Gen Z. I see it from my kids and um, I'm going to go back and start talking to them immediately. You've got one or two more years. <laughs> before you overcome any kind of fear you might have developed. So <laughs> I'm having a conversation in fact tonight. <laughs> Good to um, you. But we actually come across another concept quite often as well at Women in Football, and that is imposter syndrome. We hear it so many mm -hmm. times from our members on webinars or on our courses or, or on our um, round tables that uh, quite often people do feel like they will, they are fake, they will be discovered, they don't deserve where they are. And I also um, recently came across a study, it was done across 6,000 adults in the UK, it was a financial institution that did the, test, the, the survey, but 25% um, more women uh, feel the imposter syndrome compared to men. So there is another psychology behind it, I'm sure as well, but how, how would you overcome the imposter syndrome? It's, it's, a, it's a really big question um, for a couple of reasons. Um, imposter, you know, a, a survey that, like the one you just described is, um, there is a psychology that goes with it, but it's a, a conditioned psychology. There isn't a there isn't a naturally gendered difference, you know, in terms of people's ability to deal with fear, or in terms of people's ability to build confidence. What's different is the rules of the game for men and women. What's different is the cultural conditions for men and women. It is a reality, you know, if we look at financial institutions or if we look at sport, it is a reality that they that women have been on the edges of power women have consistently been told that they are less deserving and shown that they are less deserving in things like pay gap and um, opportunity, et cetera. So we know it's not true in our hearts. Um, you know, ask a woman and she knows it's not really true, but the cultural conditions that she lives in reinforce it constantly. So it takes a lot of um, effort to be able to see it as it is and step outside of that um you know and and come back to what is closer to a natural psychology your ability to fear less or your ability to have confidence is absolutely no different to the the man next to you what's different is the conditions that continue to drive your psychology yeah. so i feel so strongly with imposter syndrome that what we really need to be focused on is the culture yeah. that drives that psychology but at the same time, there are many techniques and ways of, um, you know, emphasizing uh, confidence and being able to overcome fear that are useful for women along the journey to do that. But predominantly, you know, I want to say to people, it's, it's actually not all in your head. That idea of being an imposter isn't a female thing. It's the rules of the game. Yeah. Um, and it's so important to make that distinction, because when we can see that, we can step outside of that and go, OK. You know, all right, well, then how would I negotiate a pay rise differently? Or how would I present myself in a resume? Or how would I respond when somebody has suggested I took too much credit for the work? Or um, that I don't have enough experience when I have at least as much as the guy applying for that role. Yeah. Right. You know, it's not true in your heart. You know, on a factual basis, you've got just the capability, the same capability. But it's a conditioned cultural psychology that lets us feel like imposters. So, you know, this, it, the, the main takeout here is that there is no significant gendered difference mm -hmm. in the ability to deal with fear or to build confidence. Yeah, that's great. And also in the book, you talk about um, winning shallow and winning deep. And I like those concepts a lot, too. And the scarcity mindset. 
Um, we have some great questions coming in through the chat as well, but um, if you could just briefly talk about those three concepts as well, that would be great. Sure. Um, I described the difference between winning shallow and winning deep. Um, winning shallow is when you're chasing a win so that you're not left behind, so that you're not revealed as a loser, so that you're not seen as not good enough. Um, and basically it's very outcome focused, you know, so a, a shallow win is kind of never getting off the treadmill of performing because you don't really think you can, or you don't think that you would be okay or be seen as okay if you did. So it's almost like an overperformance or an overperformative mindset. Um, and, you know, it's a shallow win doesn't, you don't have that feeling of the richness of your own success that goes with it. As I said before, that you, it's not just winning, it's feeling your wins. It's enjoying your success. It's being um, proud of where you are and what you've done, even if you've got in your mind, you've got a long way to go and you're nowhere near the top of your mountain, but it's still being able to appreciate yourself and what, what you've got, you know, within the win. Um, Winning deep, on the other hand, is um, where it's quite often associated with, with um, when there's a purpose outside of your own scoreboard, so to speak. You know, when this, it means something else to you. Winning deep is where there's joy involved. Even if there's also struggle and blood, sweat and tears and pain, there's also a level of joy. It can be emotional, um, whereas winning shallow is, you know, the emotions are very narrowed. Um, winning deep is sort of, it, it's sustainable. It's something that you can smile when you think about rather than, you know, cringe, oh, I wish I'd done it a bit better, or it was a silver medal, not a gold, or we didn't get as far as we could. They're, they're winning shallow statements. Winning deep is an entirely different phenomena. And I think that that shift over is like a wholehearted shift. Yeah. It's like when you can bring all of yourself to your performance, not just you with the mask on performing as perfect guru or perfect yeah. pip, you know, that's, that's the difference. And then scarcity, uh, the idea of scarcity mindset is very close to sort of winning shallow. So when we see scarcity, it's where it's kind of like the foundational idea that there isn't enough success to go around, right? We, we're so well versed in the idea that there's only one winner um, you know, there's no second place. How many times do we hear the, the slogans and the statements? But what that creates is a scarcity mindset, which means I've, I've only got this small window. Everything's urgent. You know, um, there's, uh, there's, there's no time to rest. Um, I, I've got to get it 100% right. There's no mistakes. Um, and, you know, if I, don't get my, if I don't get my slice and keep hold of it and make sure you don't get a slice which is like a, a comparison, competitive, um, overblown competitive mindset that leads to that sort of scarcity idea. And, and both winning shallow and scarcity for me, they just rob us of the joy of our own potential, of the, the um, blood, sweat and tears of our own talent. You know, it's, so it's, it's not just about the outcome. The outcome is not your worth. Yeah. You know, the scoreboard is not your worth. But when you have a scarcity mindset or a winning shallow mindset, that's how it feels. Yeah. yeah. Well, these are great answers and discussions. And I have a few questions that are coming through. So the first one is from Jen O'Neill, editor of She Kicks. Um, why is it that we are so often able to offer clear and positive advice and encouragement to others, yet cannot apply the same clarity of thought or confident assurance to ourselves? How can we adapt that to help ourselves too? Mm, that's a great question, Jen. Um, I, I think the answer may lie somewhere in what I was talking about, about before of being, you know, that sort of so high functioning and, and so um, ready to fix self and others that we don't actually plant our feet long enough to look at the truth of our own fears and face what they're costing us. Because if we do, we'd see that the cost is too high and we'd want to respond. So I think also where there is a, you know, where 
that sometimes that sort of fear of not being good enough can show up in overworking, overhelping, um, over investing, um, being being, you know, unquestionably perfect um, in your efforts to to do things for other people, um, including coaching them. And you know, so when you can stay a little bit longer and say, well, why would I sacrifice me um, over and over again to take a call at nine p.m. or seven a.m. Or why would I, you know, small example, but why, why would I continue to not apply the things to myself that I do to others? And there's an answer that is absolutely f- about fear of not being good enough in there. It's like, ha- how can I be still lovable and still keep my worth while, um, while taking care of my own needs? You know, yeah. so I, I think that high really high functioning people quite often do this right it's like oh yeah it's it's like a dentist with toothache (laughs) you know you don't ask a psychologist they're always the same it's like you know you don't take the time necessarily to work on um psychological space your own mental well-being you you have to plant your feet stay a bit longer and ask what you need yourself what do you need yourself yeah, exactly. And that fear also, I think, um, again, another common theme that we hear is women are unable to say no, you know, mm-hmm. especially in the workplace or when people are constantly demanding things from them, whether it's additional work or again, you know, I find myself quite often, you know, when we're trying to find um, a common time for a meeting among you know, male board members on another board that I sit, I'm the one that always gives in and immediately says, okay, I'll change my schedule and I'll, I'll join the board call. So I think learning to say no is an important part of that, um, trying to start solving your, your, your problems and questions as well. You know, there's, there's a lovely saying that you remind me of that's, um, you teach people how to treat you. Yeah. So if you are the one who always concedes, everyone knows that you will, and that's how they'll treat you. Yeah. Whereas if you say no, people quickly get the idea that you're, you know, you're not the one who will make the concession every time. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember the story of the giving tree. Um, mm-hmm. I, I forget who, uh, who wrote that at the moment, but it's really a story of a mother um, and how the mother is a metaphor. The story of the giving tree is a, a story of the mother and it's, how um, you know constantly she is she has given her shelter and her fruit and her um, right down to to in in the story you know she, eventually it's a stump sitting there and and the son comes back and sits on the stump that is still the mother and and uh, you know at the time of writing and for many decades that has been seen as like a a story of the the generosity of the woman and the generosity of the mother. But actually, it's an abuse. (laughs) If you reread that story with the lens that we're talking about, that's a story of um, being taken advantage of and um, some teaching somebody how to treat you. So, you know, I think we have to flip the giving tree story on its head and um, treat ourselves the way that um, we would expect to treat other people. And even just that single sentence of like, you will teach people how to treat you. If you take that as your mantra, things start to shift. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a good one. Um, there's a question from Bruce Tung. How do you distinguish between fear and a good amount of adrenaline and nerves? Yeah, great question. So fear has got a very somatic or very physical um, component for most of us, you know, um, I often talk about it with athletes as like, a set, is, it, is it really um, fear that might get in your way or is it readiness? You know, the kind of when we're getting ready, uh, I talk about it in the book, um, when we're getting ready for a performance of some, some kind, let's say it's your driving test or a, a big game or a presentation or something like that, your cortisol levels will change, your um, vision narrows, your breathing changes, your palms sweat, your the blood doesn't go to your extremities. So all of those things are completely normal parts of getting ready, but we, we can label them as fear. They're actually something more like arousal, you know, readiness and arousal. Where it, move, where it t- 
tips into fear is where we add that story that goes with it of, oh my, this is going to go horribly wrong. I'm going to be shown up in front of people I care about, or I'm going to be shamed in some way, or I'm going to fail. I'm going to miss it. Or, you know, when we run the story in the back, that's where it actually becomes fear. The physical aspects of arousal are pretty inevitable for most people. And again, with techniques, you can deal with those and have them at a, um, a tone and a, a volume that you can that you're okay with you know I've worked with athletes I worked with one athlete in Australia who played 250 games in his sport and he threw up before every single one <laughs> you know and nothing that anybody could do would would change up him it was actually a strange part of him being ready because he was so somatic he felt performance in his body felt performance um, arousal in his body but it didn't get in the way of his performance it was just not very nice for him because he didn't have the um, tape running in his head at the same time that he wasn't worth, wasn't going to be worth it. He wasn't going to be good enough. That's yeah. the diff. That's the distinction. It became part of the ritual, I guess, huh? <laughs> right. Yeah. Kind of an unpleasant one for him, but it, it was part of his his prep. <laughs> yeah. um, great. Another one from Faye, Faye Carruthers. Um, hi, Pippa. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk, and everything you've said is really resonating. What tips do you have to deal with the fear and doubt that enter into your head every day? For example, a comparison to someone else, or what if I put myself in a worse position by saying this or doing this job or doing this, sorry, not job. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I mean, this is kind of the start of it all, right, Faye? This is, this is where we kind of look at both the, um, the uh, in the moment fear and the not good enough fear and and you know this idea of taking a step and having a real look at what you're afraid of so when you hear yourself saying what if i'm not good enough or what if i get it wrong i would say to you it sounds very very odd but it's a practical um example for you perhaps go to a mirror <laughs> look yourself in the eyes and 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 don't look away don't look away look yourself in the eyes and stay there for 30 seconds and just ask yourself the same question while you're looking at yourself in the eye um, and, and see what comes back, see what the answer is. Because that we have 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day and the very large majority of those are negative and repetitive. So that nonsense chat about you not being good enough um, just needs something to override it. We have to constantly interfere and override it this is why you actually have to deal with fear it won't go away on its own it's there's too many thoughts every day right you have to intervene and turn it down and so that's just a, like a tiny little exercise to go and just look connect with yourself and you'll get a different answer to all of that chat flying around about you not being good enough because you know that that's not true Excellent. Thank you. Um, here is a, another one. Um, Emma Waldron. How do you battle the fear that when you do so much to promote others, especially your peers, they will not do the same for you when it matters, i.e. when you're both being considered for a promotion and there isn't much, much since at the top? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, what that Absolutely. makes me think there isn't much space at the top apparently <laughs> there isn't much space at the top yeah. there isn't much space at the top but that you can hear that potential to drift into scarcity mentality there right that idea that there isn't enough success or love to go around there's only a couple of jobs at the top we know that but um i that's why i think that that shouldn't be the focus so if you enter into those um, relationships or, or um, you know, those opportunities to promote or support a colleague um, and you have fear in your heart or fear in the back of your mind that it won't be reciprocated, it won't come your way, then actually you're entering into those, those exchanges with an expectation. And it's probably an expectation based somewhere in fear. So I would say to you, how could you drop that? 
how could you park that and um, just do the promoting and encouraging and supporting and lifting of others that feels right and good to you without an expectation of the exchange. Because when we kind of do that um, bartering system in our, in our own minds of, you know, uh, who's got your back, we, we get into that kind of tribal loyalty bit. And that's all fear. That's fear town. You know, it's not a place to live and it's definitely not a place to succeed from. So I would say lift other people, support other people if you um, if it feels right and true to you. Um, but it's. It is, I, I totally agree, it is really hard. Um, and I would say if you're feeling that a lot and if that's the culture that you're in a lot, maybe it's the culture, not you, right? Maybe it's not all just about you and your behavior or your thoughts on it. Maybe it's a lot to do with the culture. So, you know, how can you challenge the culture? Also hard. Yeah. But I was also very intrigued by the um, media, female media executive uh, example in your book, where she literally handpicked her successor, but then got too jealous and challenged um, that, and again, the fear of not being loved because this other person became very popular and very well liked. And I couldn't believe that, you know, she went into such negative behavior, which ended up you know, getting herself fired um, in the end. So if yeah. as a woman, you're at the receiving end of discrimination from another female executive, it's even much more hurtful. Um, mm. How would you actually, you know, address that? Mm. Is it the queen bee well, syndrome or what, what do you do to sort of combat that? In the story in the book that you talk about with, Car with Caroline, um, really, that was a cultural example, right? Because she, she, if she had actually found a way to address the amount of angst and fear she was already carrying and before she ever invited her protege into the fold, um, she would have had a very different response. You know, any any good leader is looking at somebody um, succeeding in their team and thinking, great stuff. I'm really happy about that. But when we're in cultures that um, drive fear, then it becomes scarcity. Right. And, and we're in that battle. And she just couldn't cope with somebody else um, doing well because she felt that that would be at her cost. Yeah. Right. So she became very jealous and very destructive in, in that example. But I think, you know, this, it, to answer your question, what would you do if that came at you, or you were discriminated against, or, um, you know, there was, there was something in that sort of negative vein from a female colleague or a female boss, right? Firstly, ouch, we know that that really hurts. And I would say, um, don't hide the ouch. <laughs> You don't have to share it with the boss, first of all, but recognize and authentically feel what you feel and talk about it with somebody, even if that's somebody completely out of work, somebody out of your environment. You know, one thing I know about women in football is that they net, the networks are wonderful and, and supportive. And when you feel the ouch, speak it out loud to somebody and recognize it as, as something that's hurt you rather than something that's just irritated you. Yeah. irritation and anger are much easier to express than hurt so first do that and then think about whether you want to explore that with that colleague and that might depend on what kind of relationship you already have what kind of dynamics there are whether it's very formal whether whether it's um you know uh, very structured but I tell you what wherever I've seen somebody be super brave like that and have a compassionate courageous conversation it's changed things for both parties I can think of a couple of examples where um, uh, somebody's actually said hey when you said that this is this is the way I felt and I'd really love to discuss it you know it can be just as simple as that you know um, you might say I'm, I'm contemplating my reaction but I felt something close to disappointment when that was said and I'm trying to work out why. Can we have a chat about it? Yeah. You know, so something as open um, and as uh, as simple as that to get it on the table. 
once you've done that, again, it goes back to you teach people how to treat you, right? And you've gone past that scarcity that your female colleague probably feels as well yeah. and into something that's more wholehearted and human and real, right? Yeah. Because we'll continue, culture's live, we continually create it. So when you take that little brave move like that, you actually change massive things in ripple effects. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's a wreck, but it, the, the first thing is recognize actually what that emotion was, which might be like really deep disappointment or hurt rather yeah. than irritation, or it's so much easier to sort of blame and get angry or um, offended, but that's not the real emotion. There's something more ouch in it. Yeah, exactly. Technical but term. Again, not be afraid to have these difficult conversations as well, right? So that's that's where it's yep, for sure. Another question from Sarah Nicholas. Um, a lot of organizations are winning shallow whilst having deep winners having to live against the scoreboard. How would you suggest managing this if the culture doesn't fit? Is this about challenging the culture? I feel that the last answer almost caught some of this, she was saying, not the, not this last one, probably two before. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a couple of, a couple of things. There's many deep winners who are um, in kind of forced situations or, or, you know, shallow win forced situations. You can operate in a shallow win organization if you're a deep winner, but it's got a big cost. And if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that you have things that fill your cup from outside regularly. And many advocates for change who are kind of inside the tent and trying to work on things to improve it feel this regularly. So you're not on your own with that. Um, but I think, you know, that, that's an important part of it, making sure that you've, you're getting the nurture and support from elsewhere. But the basic answer is yes, you should challenge the culture. And it's so easy to say, uh, ra uh, you know, say rather than do, um, you know, but as I, as I mentioned before, and as you just alluded to, Ebru, that those, those little brave moments where you can wholeheartedly compassionately openly without anger say hey can we have a little talk about that moment you know and just open the conversation it shifts something it shifts something essential in the dynamic you know something in the essence of the dynamic um, and that's where culture change happens so yeah. you know yes that is the answer but it's not easy work and you need to link arms while you're doing it yeah Exactly. And one from Julie Kissick. She's saying, thank you so much, Pippa. This is powerful stuff. Um, the pandemic has probably left lots of us wanting to make some quite big life changes. How can we turn this negative period we've been through into something positive and act on what we think needs to change? Mm. Again, great question. I love your questions, guys. Uh, <laughs> but um, this is this is where I think um, this idea of, of purpose comes in. You know, purpose is kind of a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but I do think there's something really compelling in the idea of working out, doing the work to understand who you are as well as what you do, what you care about as well as what you do, right? And that's, that's kind of, um, when you think about making a big life change, sometimes it, sometimes it feels like the easiest thing to do is cut and run. But when you really think, what do I care about most? You know, this, uh, the, I can use the example of myself here coming out of the FA and thinking that that wasn't the right cultural environment for me and what I wanted to achieve. But what I knew was that football offered me a massive platform for what I want to achieve, especially for women and girls and for a different archetype for women working in sport. So uh, having a good reflect at that moment is like, actually, this gives me a platform and there's some real discomfort in the platform for me. How do I deal with the discomfort? Mm -hmm. What I need to do is stay in yeah. and find the ways to carve a path. Other times in my life, and you know, I can think of many other people I've worked with where the right thing is actually to make the change and to come out of a situation. And, and you kind of know the difference if you if it no longer feeds your soul 
And if you genuinely believe that there is a toxicity in that environment that isn't changeable, you can't see an avenue to change. Where you think people just maybe don't get it or haven't had the right kind of conversations um, or where you feel maybe lonely in an organization, if you're if you think you're the only one feeling this way or you might be the only woman then that's where you have to find your um, strength uh, from other places to stay in but ask yourself what it is that feels most purposeful and compelling to you um, and and where you can best serve that that aim um, yeah. and is it in your environment or is it stepping out of your environment yeah that's a good you know good advice um, last two questions, Jamie Roberts from Hitting the Areas podcast. I coach a non-league football side. The team are going through a rough patch currently and also struggle to play well away from home. Training is good, but when they step over the line on a Saturday, they struggle to perform to their ability and the lack of confidence is evident. What advice would you give to the management team to help with them uh, come out of their shell? Hmm. Um, Jamie, in the book, I talk about some of the sort of in the moment fear techniques as like three umbrella techniques, which are which, you know, um, can help you navigate with individual players, um, how they stay in the moment and stay mentally free. Um, but it sounds like there might be some perspective stuff that would be useful for you and the team, you and your staff and the team to do, um, you know, as well. And the one you know, it, people might not be surprised at me saying this, but the one I would go to is fun, <laughs> right? A brilliant antidote to fear is fun. And um, we kind of don't think of it. We think of like calming down, but sometimes mm -hmm. calming down isn't as powerful as letting go and having a laugh and doing something unexpected. You know, maybe you need to stand up at the, at, at the uh, front of the um, change room and, and sing to them or something, but you know, um, changing the tone and the environment and the mood is uh, fun is actually just as powerful as calmness. And I think it gets overlooked a bit, you know, because our mood is very quickly changeable. Our, our psychological emotion, our mood can change super quick. You can listen to a couple of your favorite tunes and you, you mood, your mood changes, right? So how can you change the tone from oh God, the game's coming. I don't know what to do. To, you know, I've got that uh, impending feeling of dread again. Right there, change it up. Go make it more fun. Like even at the expense of all the things you might prefer to do, preparing, which might be more detail around, you know, how you want to play or your game plan or let go of it all for a week or two and have some fun and see what happens. Yeah. I think now um, there are great tactics for, for Jamie to take back. And the last question is from Laura Wolf. As a mother of two boys, I constantly feel like I'm shaping their lives and fearful of my parenting being not good enough. And as a working mother, how do you stop those feelings of guilt and fear about not being able to do both, but be a good mother and be great at work at the same time? The pandemic has really brought these feelings out for many of us working moms. Mm. No doubt it has. It's been a very tough time for working moms. I think very underexplored area. And, you know, kudos to you and, and um, to every other working mom out there because it's not been an easy time. Um, but to answer your question about the um, how do I deal with you know the fear of not showing up as good enough in each area, I think firstly chunk it down. You know if we're going to take this to a, a simple exercise, there's, there's actually a range of questions in the book that help explore this. But get yourself a pen and a bit of paper and write down on one page all the ways that you're showing up as not good enough right now, right? And then if you have the opportunity, if you've got the luxury of the opportunity of somebody who loves you, sit down with them without being, you know, overly modest about it and ask them to rate the truth of each one of those sentences or statements one to 10 um, and rank that and see how many are still left on your page. And your job is to not um, uh, dismiss or deny anybody else that, you know, your, your loved person's view of you, but to just let that be the truth. And then look at the ones that are still on the page. 
right? Because we it, we so quickly drift into perfectionism um, and, and this idea that we've got to be, you know, almighty in every area of life. I mean, we can't even have two thoughts. We can't even multitask. We can't have two thoughts at once, let alone do two massive jobs like being a mother and, and working in the middle of a pandemic. You know, that's it, it's impossible to do everything well. So look what's still left on the page and think, how can I actually address these things? What, what do, are they real? Do they feel real to me or do they feel like emotional, um, invasive emotional thoughts? If they are, chuck them in the bin. If there is something real in there, what might I do differently to make space to be better at this? So it's not what, how do I do more? That's not it. What can I shift to allow some space that I can be a bit better at this thing that's still on my page? So something's got to go on your stop doing list or your park list before you add something to your get better list. That's the deal. Excellent. Um, there are actually, unfortunately, two more questions. Normally we have one hour. Do you want to go for five more minutes quickly? Sure. Yeah, okay. no problem. Um, Emily Stout says, in terms of working with young athletes, people on finding their own purpose and values in a youth sport world where these are often directed, determined by coaches and parents, do you have any advice on this? Yeah. Oh, I love that you've picked that up. You know, sometimes I, I feel like values are, are just far too imposed. Truth is we can never impose values on anybody. They have to be um, inspired, you know? So I would say, you know, something I've done with young athletes before is, um, uh, it sounds crazy, but like a, a graffiti exercise. So um, huge sheets of old, you know, huge, um, uh, sheets of old cloth or paper and spray cans um, and ask them to uh, spray cans or paintbrushes and ask them to paint what they care most about in the world right so when you say the word value to a young person they're like I don't really get it what is a value you know so ask them what they care most about in the world or who what they would like other people to describe them as and get them to draw it paint it you know uh, let them have fun with it um, they can, uh, I've also seen it done in the uh, younger England teams with um, <laughs> a, a performance, like a show to describe what they cared most about and what they want people to think of them. You know, that, that particular team were very into Mamma Mia, so they did it that way. So, um, you know, you can do it in lots of different ways, but it's about creating the space for it to emerge from your players rather than telling them what it is. And using user-friendly language. Who do I, what do I want people to say about me? How would I like to be seen? Um, and, you know, what do I care about? They're, they're better than talking about values for younger athletes because they feel too sort of conformist almost. And that's not the point. We want people to grow into their best selves, right? Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, I think this is, it. Um, thank you very much for all the great uh, audience and all the great questions, but most importantly to Pippa for such an amazing afternoon and it has been hugely valuable and helpful. Um, your book is amazing, your online speech is amazing, so we were very lucky to host you today and hopefully all our um, attendees have been um, equally enthusiastic to hear your insights. Um, all this recording will be posted online um, in a few hours or tomorrow. So those who missed it or would like to watch it again will have access, but stay well until our next webinar and wonderful to have you as part of our network. Thanks so much, Ebru. Much appreciated. Thanks, everyone.